So, the outcome for this class, we will be summarizing the pathophysiology of the more common connective tissue disorders. And we will take that information and differentiate it between abnormal assessments um, and compare that to someone that has a quote unquote normal adult assessment. We will identify diagnostic studies that are associated with connective tissue disorders. And we will judge the appropriateness and safety of administering the more common medications that are used for the treatment of connective tissue disorders. These disorders cannot be corrected, they cannot be fixed, but they can, um, they can be managed. So again, we are talking about the client being self-aware. We are talking about the client playing an active role in their treatment plan and managing their disorder. And we will evaluate the needs of clients with connective tissue disorders and or their families for education that is needed to prevent and manage the disorder. So again, this is a lot of patient education. And because we are nurses, we are going to formulate a plan of care for this client with a connective tissue disorder. So, a connective tissue disorder is an alteration or disruption of the proper function of connective tissues within the body. Now, connective tissue is made up of collagen and reticular fibers, and these fibers are composed of collagen and elastin. So, this connective tissue will form a matrix that will cover and support and protect structures and organs, and it will aid in movement. So <clears throat> here what we are talking about is not so much muscular, but joint. So in connective tissue disease, collagen and elastin are damaged by inflammation or it's an immune system dysfunction. So again, we are thinking about the immune system because this can play a part in connective tissue diseases and then inflammation. So then we are back to um, allergic disorders and inflammation triggers is what I'm referring to. So some examples of connective tissue are bone, cartilage, tendons, <clears throat> ligaments, lymphatic tissue, and bone marrow. So rheumatic disorders, rheumatic disorders are commonly called arthritis or inflammation of the joints. And we have heard this a lot. You know, we always know somebody that has arthritis, somebody who complains of arthritic pain. Um, you know, when you turn on the television, when you're seeing commercials, they're always talking about um, arthritis pain medications, some over the counter, some prescriptions. So it, it is very common. It will affect both males and females. Uh, some can occur at any age, and that is rheumatoid arthritis. And then some can occur at certain ages, and that is osteoarthritis. So, Rheumatic disorders, the bone, the, I'm sorry, excuse me, the basic classification monoarticular is mono. When we think of mono, we think of one. So mono will affect one joint. Polyarticular, so when we think of poly, we think of many. And so polyarticular is going to affect multiple joints. And then there is inflammatory versus non-inflammatory. And when we're talking about this, we are talking about rheumatoid arthritis versus osteoarthritis. So I always like to include a little bit of pathophysiology because for some of you this may help you understand the basics of how this happens. Others have no, um, have no interest in it and that's fine. You can just, I don't know, maybe disregard this information however you feel. So the general pathophysiology will include changes in the joint and or the connective tissue, because again, we are talking about 
connective tissue disorders, but these, this connective tissue is what surrounds the joint to protect the joint and to help the joint move. So damage to these joints will occur as a response to the inflammatory process. So there is going to be something, some sort of trigger that is going to piss off this joint and make the joint angry and inflamed. So primary rheumatic disorders um, is when the problem is in the immune system's inflammatory response. And then there are degenerative rheumatic disorders, and this is when the inflammation is a secondary response. And we have all seen, um, you know, some, some reports where we have seen degenerative joint disease, or we have heard someone that has <clears throat> degenerative joint disease, and that is just something that happens over time with the older adult population. So rheumatic disorders, inflammatory, it is a type 3 hypersensitivity immune disorder. Remember when we were talking about allergic disorders, we were talking about types 1 and 4 for hypersensitivity reactions. A rheumatic disorder is a type 3 three hypersensitivity immune disorder and is it is all about the inflammatory process gone wrong something has gone wrong with um, with this joint and this joint is angry it is an inappropriate response to an invasion or a foreign agent and again this is going to involve a series of related steps and as with hypersensitivity disorders, if you remember, there is always a trigger or an antigen. There is always something that is going to start this um, inflammatory process. So the inflammatory process can involve joints, such as in lupus and RA, rheumatoid arthritis. It can involve the skeletal muscle, when it involves bones, we refer to it as osteoarthritis. Ligaments, the tendons, when we're talking about tendons, we are talking about spondylitis. The connective tissue surrounding the joint, we can talk about the vascular system, and we can also talk about the skin in the case of scleroderma. So common signs and symptoms of rheumatic disorders, there will be chronic inflammation. Your client will appear to be in pain. They will tell you that they're in pain. You may see that there is limitation of movement. There is limitation of range of motion, and they may also verbalize this. And there can be structural changes or degeneration. And we see this most often in knees and hands, sometimes you will see it in feet. So common disorder, disorders are again rheumatoid arthritis, that is the RA, lupus and scleroderma. And ladies, please, ladies and gentlemen, please listen up, listen up, and then listen up one more time. When we are talking about common disorders, these are the the disorders that I am referring to. I am referring to rheumatoid arthritis, RA. I will be discussing lupus. I will be talking about scleroderma. Vasculitis and osteoarthritis are also common disorders. So rheumatic disorders, the onset may be acute or insidious. Treatment can either be simple or complex. Right, and so this we know. It's either going to be something that we can do very simply or it is going to be a more complicated um, treatment plan. When we are talking about a simple treatment plan, we are talking about relieving localized symptoms. Whatever is going on with my patient, with my client, it is going to be localized. It may be localized to one joint. Um, when we are talking about complex, we could be talking about things that are more systemic such as lupus or scleroderma. So the exact etiology of rheumatoid arthritis is unclear. However, genetics and environmental factors are thought to play a key role in the development of the disease. So this tells me that if, again, there is that word atopy, even though I'm not using it here, 
um, a TAPI will, will exist here for connective tissue disorders. So it just stands to reason that if a family member has rheumatoid arthritis, if a family member has RA, then there is a greater chance that other family members will have it also. There is a genetic component. And then there is also environmental, because remember, there is a trigger here that is going to offset this inflammatory process. So it could be something in, in our environment that could be causing this. Um, most people with RA will complain of joint pain, um, joint muscle aches um, when the weather is cooler, when the weather is cold, when they've overworked their joints, maybe they've done a little bit more yard work, um, maybe they've done something that has a greater impact on their joints, such as running. Um, <clears throat> that will have a huge impact. So first degree relatives of RA patients are one and a half times higher risk than the general population. So again, a topy is going to come into play here. So I know that if my mother, brother, father, sister has RA, then there is a great chance that I am also going to develop RA. So females are two and a half times more likely to be affected than males. So now I know the female population is uh, more popular with RA. And onset is most common in the third to fifth decade. So this means that I can look forward to this if I have a first degree relative. I can look forward to this somewhere in between my 30s and my 50s. I mean, I, I'm awful at math. I suck at math, but even I can figure that out. So some environmental factors that can initiate the development of this disease is cigarette smoke, right? Cigarette smoking is going to be bad for me, right? It's going to affect my lungs, but now I know it can intensify my RA, my joint disease. Bacteria, so this is a bacteria that I may be coming into contact with. Maybe I caught a virus and now there's a secondary bacterial infection. And um, also just viruses. Some clinical manifestations. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up, listen up, and then listen up one more time. Clinical manifestations. There will be joint pain. Your client will complain of joint pain. There will be joint swelling. You may be able to see the swelling in the joints. The knee may look swollen. The elbow may look swollen. The hands may be swollen. Erythema, and erythema is redness of the skin that is due to this inflammation. There is going to be stiffness in the morning. They, ha they may have more morning stiffness than at any other time of day. So if someone is getting up in the morning, if they're usually up at 6 and can be out the door by 7 or 7.15, um, I am a mother and I can tell you that I have never had that luxury where I can be out the door in 1 hour and 15 minutes. But um, it can happen, I guess. But this would be the person who says, okay, I just need an hour to get out the door. But then over time, now I need an hour and a half. Now I need two hours because when I get up in the morning, I am feeling very stiff. I'm feeling very sore. I need to take my hot shower. I need to take my ibuprofen. I need to um, let all of these things work before I can get myself dressed and out the door. They will complain of fatigue. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen up. They will complain of fatigue and onset will be rapid. Complaints of joint and muscle pain that will evolve into joint pain with synovitis. Synovitis is inflammation of the synovial membrane that leads to joint destruction and then deformity. So what is happening to this joint is that synovial fluid that is going to protect that joint is going to wear away. And that is a degenerative change. However, when this synovial fluid becomes inflamed, because of a trigger, because of the antigen, then that is going to lead to joint destruction and that is going to lead to the joint changing shape, the deformity. So if left untreated, this will lead to irreversible joint damage and your client may somehow be disabled because of this damage. 
Some common joint deformities will include swan neck deformity, a boutonniere deformity, and ulnar deviation. Um, all of those are in your textbook if you, or I guess you could, um, you know, do what you guys do, and that is Google, and you may be able to see some of those deformities. So, other clinical manifestations, pleuritis, pleuritis is an inflammation of the lining surrounding the lungs. A pleural effusion, a pleural effusion is excess fluid accumulation around the lungs, because remember, this is connective tissue. So even though connective tissue is most often around the joints, there is still connective tissue around organs of the body. So this is where the lining of the lungs and fume fluid accumulation around the lungs will come into play. And then there is pericarditis, and that is inflammation of the fibrous lining that will surround the heart. And we may see lab studies indicating anemia. So diagnosis, what will doctor do to help diagnose this RA? The process that may involve more than one evaluation by a rheumatologist. So, of course, doctor, your primary care healthcare provider, can, of course, begin the, this testing or look into this testing. But if doctor really feels as though RA is a true issue and it is truly affecting the client's life, he may um, refer them to a rheumatologist. And so now the rheumatologist is going to put this client through um, a series of tests and how do they feel, what is the onset, how long has this been going on, gather all of that information to help guide the treatment plan. So this can be diagnosed by combining signs, symptoms, lab values, radiographs, or ultrasound. So we're going to look at signs and symptoms, right? We're going to be talking to this client because it always begins with a health history. Then we're going to look at lab values. And then we may do some ultrasounds, we may do some x-rays, just to bring the whole picture all together. And so criteria has now been updated to help to diagnose RA at an earlier age so that the client can begin to manage these disorders at an earlier age and not feel such a debilitating impact. So symptoms that persist for six weeks or longer are consistent with RA. So if I wake up in the morning and it's taking me longer and longer and longer to get out the door and get myself up and moving for in the morning, and if that takes me longer than six weeks, then yes, I can suspect that I have RA. Or if my joints are hurting me and if they're hurting more than six weeks, then I can suspect that I have RA. Patients will present with peripheral joint pain that is symmetrical and complain of morning stiffness that is lasting greater than 30 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to get up, I'm going to, you know, try and get myself into the shower, and I'm going to try and get my day going, but this joint stiffness is, land, is lasting more than 30 minutes. And it has also lasted longer than six weeks. And then um, synovitis and the synovitis may be detected by ultrasound. So laboratory testing alone is not enough to diagnose RA because, again, it's going to come back to what the client is saying. What is going on with the client? Are they, how stiff are they in the morning? When do they feel comfortable in the morning? If they get up at 6 a.m. and they're not really comfortable about moving about until 7.30 or 8 o'clock, well, then yes, we can suspect RA. Um, if, or if in the evening time or early in the morning, they have increased joint pain, and that has been lasting longer than six weeks, then yes, we can suspect that they have RA. So again, lab testing alone is not enough. We have to go back to what the client is saying. 25 to 30% of patients will be negative for antibodies for RA. A positive rheumatoid factor does not always indicate the presence of RA. C-reactive protein which is a CRP lab study, an erythrocyte sedimentation rate, ESR, may be used to detect inflammation, but these are not specific to RA. And then once we get into the hospital setting and we are actually looking at our client's labs, 
whenever we suspect that there is an inflammatory process going on. These are two lab studies that you are going to look at. You're going to look at the C-reactive protein. You're going to look at the ESR. Because if there is an inflammatory disorder going on, these two lab studies will be elevated. An elevated CRP and ESR is an indicator that can be useful in distinguishing inflammatory from non-inflammatory arthritis. So, obtaining information regarding renal and hepatic functions. So we're going to be looking at the kidneys. We're going to be looking at the liver. All of this is necessary before initiating therapy as many medications can be toxic to the kidneys and the liver. And we know this, right? Because we know that the kidneys and the liver are where we filter everything. We filter food, we filter fluids, and we also filter medications. So we have to look at these lab studies before we can begin medications so that um, we know that we are being safe in administering the medications because these medications can be toxic to the kidney and the liver. Baseline complete blood counts are necessary because anti-rheumatic medications may cause cytopenias. Um, so we're looking at thrombocytopenia, which is a reduced number of platelets, leukocytopenia, which is a reduced number of white blood cells, and then anemia, which is a reduced number of red blood cells. So again, we have to pay attention to all of these lab studies. We're going to have to look at the CBC and especially the differential so that we know when we are giving these medications that we are being safe with them. Before beginning biologic therapies, and we'll talk about those in a bit, a TB test and a hepatitis test should be performed as they have the potential to reactivate dormant infections. And we will talk about that when we are talking about biologics. So radiology, we can do conventional x-rays to assess for bony erosions and then the joint space narrowing, right? This, so when we're doing an x-ray, we can get a very good um, picture of what is going on with the joint because it will illuminate the bone. And these x-rays will be repeated during treatment to assess for disease progression or also to see if the medications that, that doctor has put the client on are effective. So if the medications have been effective, then we will not see a progression of the disease, right? That only just makes sense. An MRI may, be, may detect erosions that are not seen on x-ray. We have to delve a little deeper. And for those patients who will decline an MRI for whatever reason, we can do an ultrasound. So non-pharmacological therapies, let's talk about those. Education, right? So these clients need a lot of education in how to manage these disorders, these disease processes. We can um, either make a referral to physical therapy or we can instruct them ourselves because we are well versed in range of motion exercises. We can talk about aerobic exercises. Now, aerobic not meaning, yes, go to Zumba. Or, yes, go out and do a run, but walking, swimming are all excellent um, choices for someone who has a joint disorder, um, someone who does not want the impact of, of um, an aerobic exercise. Physical and occupational therapies, we can bring these ancillary support systems in because they may know exercises that I am not aware of, right? They may know about resistance exercises. Um, they may be able to talk to them about stretching and greater range of motion exercises than I can. Nutritional support, because there may be some foods, and we know this, processed foods, anything white, that all piss off the joints, all anger the joints. The joints do not like processed foods. The joints do not like sugar. They do not like sweets. It is just going to make the joint angry. So some nutritional support. And ladies and gentlemen, please listen up, listen up, and listen up one more time. Rest periods. I cannot stress enough that rest periods are so important for this population. So if you have a working mother, if you have a mom who is out there and she's working all day, even though she, now in this uh, climate, in this environment, everyone may be working from home, but we are still working nevertheless, right? It is still tiring. But... 
she may also have children, and now we are homeschooling our children at home. Then there is the homework, and then there are the household chores. So this is someone that you would want to say, you know what? Do you really need to set the table every night for dinner? Can your daughter or can your son, can your husband, can you start delegating some household chores? While you are taking a rest period, can one of your children or can your husband throw in a load of laundry? I know how absurd this may sound, but delegating tasks, delegating household tasks and bringing the family in and talking to them about how important a rest period is for this client can only be beneficial. So the goal, the goal of pharmacological therapy is to control the inflammation, right? We want to control this inflammation because it is the inflammation that is going to lead to the joint and tissue destruction. So decreasing the inflammation will decrease the joint pain. It will um, decrease the chance of synovitis, which is the inflammation of that synovial fluid. And this is where nutritional support may come in and stiffness as well as maintaining joint function, right? So if, they're, if they are less stiff by doing range of motion exercises or by stretching, then we can um, maintain what joint function that they do have and we can also prevent further joint destruction from occurring. So this is where a lot of patient education is going in, to come into play, a lot of ancillary support physical therapy, occupational therapy, nutritional support, all offering these suggestions and guidance and education. And the most important thing is we have to get the client to buy in. I can tell you what to do, but it is up to the client to actually go home and do the stretching exercises and monitor the diet for the processed foods. So initially, we're going to start out small and then we're going to work our way up so initial treatment is going to, to include analgesics. So we may start out with Tylenol, simply Tylenol, and then how does Tylenol, you know, control your pain? If Tylenol controls your pain along with the stretching and maybe the change in the diet, then we're golden, right? Everything is great. However, I was using Tylenol and now it's been almost a year. The Tylenol is no longer working. So now maybe we need to move up to an NSAID and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, right? And then after that, because we need to decrease this inflammation, then we're going to move on to a steroid. Okay, so let's talk about these steroids, these glucocorticosteroids. They may be given PO, they may be given IM, they may be given intraarticularly, and this is when we are putting the steroid directly into that synovial fluid to handle that synovitis. We're putting it directly into that joint. <coughs> Excuse me. Or it can be given IV. And we use these to suppress inflammation and then to alter the disease process, right? Because all of, all of this is to slow down the progression of the disease. The disease is there. It's not going anywhere. It's not going, it's not going to go away. It is not going to resolve. But we can slow it down. We can manage it. Um, corticosteroids are not safe at high doses over long periods of time. And we also know with steroids that steroids need to be tapered, right? You can't just be taking, you know, 30 milligrams of prednisone on a Monday and then on Tuesday be done. That's not the way it happens. So these steroids need to be tapered off. So we're going to go from 30 milligrams down to 25 milligrams for a period of time, and then 20 milligrams, and then so on and so forth, until we are off of the steroid. And so because they need to be ta tapered, and in order to maintain that therapeutic level of the steroid, steroids need to be taken at the same time every day. Ladies and gentlemen, this will be part of your patient education. This is something that you're going to talk to your client about, and this is something that they need to understand with their medication information. These steroids need to be taken at the same time every day. And this will be especially important when they are being weaned off, tapered off. So patients who do not respond to a combination of analgesics, anti-inflammatory agents, and then these low-dose corticosteroids, are treated with disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs, and we call these drugs DMARDs. 
Okay, ladies and gentlemen, we're talking about DMARDs. Some of these may be um, familiar to you. You may have seen them on television commercials, seen literature. Methotrexate, um, Areva, Plaquenil, Azulfidine, and Zeljams. And many patients will respond well to methotrexate, which has now been accepted as the first line DMAR treatment of choice. So methotrexate um, is what doctor will go to first. Methotrexate can be taken once weekly. It can be taken PO. It can be given sub-Q. And what do we know about sub-Q? We know that if, if it's sub-Q, we know that we can um, instruct clients to do this at home. <coughs> we can instruct uh, family members. Or it can be given IM. And then traditionally, patients will move on to additional or alternative medications if the methotrexate alone is not controlling their disease. That only makes sense, right? So biologics. Over the last decade, there have been medications known as biologics, and these are genetically engineered medications that are made from living organisms and proteins that have been approved by the Food and Drug Administration to treat RA. So these medications have proven to be beneficial in slowing or halting the progression of, of RA. So <clears throat> these approved biologics must be given IV or they can be given uh, sub-Q. So again, this is something that we can teach the client or family member to do at home. Some complications um, of these disorders is decreased function of the joint, permanent joint deformity, permanent disabilities, they are at risk for infection, there is an increased risk of this population developing a cancer. So what are we going to do? How are we going to help this population? This patient, we are going to assess because that is what we do. We are nurses and we assess. We go back and we reassess. <clears throat> and if needed, we are going to assess again. <coughs> Excuse me. And we are going to look at clinical manifestations. We're looking at their gait. Is their gait unsteady? Is there a bony enlargement or swelling of affected joints? So we can be looking at feet, we can be looking at ankles, we can be looking at knees, we can be looking at hands. Are the joints red? Are they warm or hot to the touch? Is there a painful range of motion? This will put them at, again, increased risk for infection. When we are looking at their lab studies, do they have an increased serum creatinine that will be um, attributed to NSAID use? We are going to look at their elevated, uh, at, excuse me, at their liver enzymes to see if they're elevated. This may be secondary to the methotrexate that they are taking. They may be constipated, and this may be secondary to the fact that they cannot get up and move about as well as they want to, or it could be the, any narcotics that they may be using for pain. They may have nausea or oral ulcers that may be related to methotrexate use. They may have a cough or shortness of breath that may be due to interstitial lung disease, which can be caused by RA or by methotrexate therapy. So now we can see that even though um, methotrexate is the first line DMARD, that it has an awful lot of side effects. There's an awful lot of concerns that we have or that a doctor may have in using this first line, which would be the methotrexate. <coughs> Excuse me. 
then we are going to look and see is there a self-care deficit and how fatigued are they getting? Um, are they too tired to care for themselves? If they are working, are they too tired at the end of the day to come home and care for their family? Are they too tired for social activities after work at the end of the day? Of course, now we know in this climate their you know, social activities are very limited, but again, we are looking at the level of fatigue. So some nursing diagnoses for this population would be pain, pain related to the disease process, ineffective sleep pattern related to their pain that maybe they're uncomfortable lying in bed, and then the self-care deficit that is related to their decreased range of motion. Um, their joints uh, may be stiffening, they may not, be, they may not have that um, range of motion and that may be due to the fact that they have not been doing their range of motion exercises and they have not been stretching. So nursing interventions, what are we going to do for this client? Again, we are going to assess. We are looking at joint pain and we are looking at their mobility. This will be an indicator of their treatment plan. Are they following the treatment plan? Is the treatment plan effective? And um, it may also be an indicator of their degree disease, excuse me, progression. They may be following the treatment plan. They may be, you know, changing their diet. They may be eliminating those foods that are going to anger the joints. They may be eliminating their triggers, but this may still not be enough to eliminate um, or to slow down the disease progression. So maybe they still need to do all of these things, but maybe doctor needs to take a second look at their medications. Temperature, we are going to look at their vital signs because this is always an indicator of infection. We are going to look at their labs. We are going to assess for pleural effusion, pericarditis, uh, pleuritis, scleritis, episcleritis, and osteopenia. So what are we going to do? We are going to administer these analgesics, these anti-inflammatories, as doctor has ordered, and we are going to educate our patient to take these medications as doctor has ordered. We are going to administer the glucocorticosteroids as they are ordered. And again, the client needs to know that these steroids need to be taken at the same time every day. And these steroids need to be tapered. They can just not stop taking them. We will administer these DMARDs as ordered. And we will also monitor for those side effects and then any biologics that doctor has ordered. So nursing interventions, we are going to give them patient education because that is what we do. We are nurses and we educate. We are going to talk about the importance of them adhering to this treatment plan. They need to stretch every day. They need to practice their range of motion every day. They need to eliminate these foods that are going to trigger the inflammation. They need to give themselves enough time in the morning to get up and to relieve that stiffness before they get on with their day. They need to know, first of all, signs and symptoms of infection, and then they need to know that they have to <clears throat> report these signs and symptoms of infection. Immunopressive therapy should be discontinued if your client has an active infection because, right, because their immune system is already affected if they're battling an infection. So you don't want to suppress them even more. And we were going to talk to these clients about referrals to infectious disease or um, if they have uh, chronic or atypical infections, right? Because the goal is to keep them infection free. They need to stay current with their vaccinations. 
and if needed, we can refer them to physical therapy, occupational therapy, <coughs> because they may be able to instruct them on ways and means they may be able to offer them equipment that will make their activities of daily living easier. So nursing management, nursing management. Again, we are going to assess. We are going to administer these medications as they are ordered. And again, patient education, the importance of adhering to the treatment plan, reporting signs and symptoms of infection, as well as knowing the signs and symptoms of infection, assisting with referrals to infectious disease if they have chronic infections, helping them to stay compliant with their vaccinations, and then referring them to physical and occupational therapy as needed. So moving on to scleroderma. Scleroderma is estimated to be 9 to 19 cases per million per year. The usual age of onset is 30 to 50 years. The age of onset for women ranges from, from 15 to 40. So this tells me that not only am I dealing with adults, but I am also dealing with young adults. I'm dealing with teenagers because this is something that can start in the teen years. However, the risk for developing scleroderma will decline after menopause, thank goodness. And the prevalence in women will exceed the prevalence of men by a ratio of three to five. So scleroderma is not a hereditary disease, but patients with a first degree relative with the disease have a higher risk. So this, this means that they are still at risk to develop it if they have a first degree relative. So again, we can say this is a topic. It will travel in families. And again, environmental exposure, such as infectious agents may play a role, again, in triggering the disease. So again, we are talking about um, the immune system and we are talking about a trigger, the inflammatory process. So there are two main categories. There is localized, which is limited, and then there is systemic. So localized, localized will lead to what we call morphia, and morphia is isolated patches of hardened skin. There is linear scleroderma, and these are lines of thickened skin that are affecting the tissues underneath. Scleroderma and coop de saber is that thickened patch of skin on the scalp, on the head. And localized, limited scleroderma typically does not affect the internal organs. However, <clears throat> systemic scleroderma will involve not only the skin, but internal organs as well. That is what, so the difference here is localized is just going to be limited to the skin, to tissue, whereas systemic is going to affect my internal organs. There is a much poorer prognosis than localized because my internal organs are affected. So limited versus diffuse. Okay, limited versus diffuse. Ladies and gentlemen, please listen up, listen up, and then listen up for me one more time. Please know the information that is on this slide. With limited scleroderma, it is an insidious onset. It will involve the skin of the extremities that are distal to the elbows and the knees. So this is from the elbow down and the knee down. Internal organ involvement is less likely with late onset. And here we're going to talk about Raynaud's phenomenon. Raynaud's phenomenon may precede the disease diagnosis by a few years. Okay. Diffuse, diffuse scleroderma has a rapid onset. It will involve the skin of the extremities and the trunk. 
It is most likely to affect the internal organs, typically within two years, within two years. So clinical manifestations, they will be diffuse or limited systemic sclerosis may involve the skin, the lungs, the heart, the kidneys, and the musculoskeletal system. When we're talking about the skin, we are talking about patches of thickened skin that is sometimes accompanied by itching in the early stages. Pulmonary-wise, dyspnea, non-productive cough, they may have pulmonary fibrosis. There is an increased risk of lung cancer. Cardiac wise, they can have pericarditis. They can have a pericardial infusion, myocardial fibrosis. This is all around the heart, fluid around the heart, um, extra tissue around the heart. They may go into heart failure they may develop an arrhythmia. They might have uh, an irregular heartbeat. Renal-wise, kidney-wise, there may be extra protein in their urine. They may have impaired renal function. Because remember, with scleroderma, this connective tissue, if it is systemic, it is going to encompass the internal organs, and this will include the kidneys. So, um, Clinical manifestations of systemic sclerosis, again, is Raynaud's phenomenon. It is a condition in which, in which some areas of the body will feel numb and cool under certain circumstances. And Raynaud's phenomenon has also been linked to Tylenol. Um, there can be scleroderma renal crisis. And this is, has to do with the uh, connective tissue be around the kidneys becoming hardened. They may develop pulmonary hypertension. And all of this is due to abnormal vasoconstriction of the small vessels as a result of functional changes in the arteries. So mild renal dysfunction is common. Scleroderma renal crisis will occur in approximately 10 to 20 percent of patients with diffuse systemic scleroderma. So, um, therefore, it is rare in those with limited form because remember, with limited, it is only limited to the skin, whereas with systemic, we are talking about internal organs. It is characterized by this sudden onset of severe hypertension, protein in the urine, and then progressive renal failure. And then morbidity and mortality, of course, because the kidneys are involved, are high. So pulmonary artery hypertension symptoms will develop subtly. There will be generalized weakness on exertion. Later on, shortness of breath will develop. Pulmonary disease is the leading cause of death in systemic scleroderma patients. So systemic is fatal. So diagnosis, how is doctor going to diagnose this? Diagnosis is supported by the presence of clinical manifestations and then the serum antibodies. So lab testing will confirm the diagnosis, but it will not exclude it. So common lab testing will include anti-nuclear antibody testing, which is an ANA screening, and then testing for more specific antibodies. So, do so doctor will do the NNA, ANA excuse me, first, and then based on that result, he will look and say, okay, do we need to do more specific testing? More than 95% of patients will have at least one antibody present. X-rays may reveal subcutaneous calcification, distal esophageal hypomotility, and then pulmonary fibrosis. And this is because all of those internal organs are going to be affected. 
pulmonary function tests will be important to assess the vital lung capacity and then lung compliance. So we have to know how well those lungs are working. EKGs will be done routinely to assess for pulmonary artery hypertension and then myocardial involvement. We want to know how is the lungs working, how, are the, how is the heart working. Before treatment will be initiated, bronchioalveolar lavage and then right heart catheterization um, will be done to diagnose if there is any interstitial lung disease because we have to know, doctor has to know exactly what is going on with this heart and with the lung before we can begin treatment because if the hung, excuse me, if the lung and the heart are involved, then we need to be more cautious with treatment. And we will do kidney biopsies to diagnose any renal disease. So treatment, what are we gonna do for this population? Well, there is no single treatment to manage this scleroderma. Treatment will be focused on the specific organ involved and the way the client is presenting clinically. Systemic steroids will be used to suppress the immune response, right? Because we wanna stop this inflammatory response from progressing. We can use antihistamines to alleviate paritis. And again, paritis is just a fancy name for itching. <clears throat> We can use topical ointments and moisturizers to help soften the skin and assist with paritis, right? Because the hardening of the skin and the flakiness of the skin is what is um, disturbing to the client. So if we can work to soften that skin and help with the itching, they will be more comfortable. Then we can use vasodilators. Well, doctor will prescribe a vasodilator to improve circulation to help to treat Raynaud's phenomenon, to treat pulmonary hypertension, and to treat any renal impairment. Complications, complications are always infection. Because the kidneys are involved, they can go into renal failure. Because the heart is involved, they can go into heart failure. They can develop pulmonary fibrosis. This is tissue around the, um, around the heart. And they may pass away. So scleroderma can be fatal, or they can die from the complications of scleroderma. Nursing management, what are we going to do? We are going to assess because we are nurses and nurses assess, and then we will administer medications. And with administering these medications, we are going to provide patient education for these medications. We are going to talk to them about range of motion exercises because we want to keep those joints fluid and help them to um, not become stiff. We will assist in referring clients to the pulmonologist, the gastroenterologist, and physical therapist as needed because they will have additional information for the client on how to manage this disease. And because this can be fatal and because this will impact their life, referring to counseling um, as needed. Patient education will include the disease process. Patients need to know what is coming. They need to know the next phase of their illness and how to protect their skin integrity because um, especially if they're, they have limited scleroderma, we don't, want, we don't want to do anything to break that barrier, that skin barrier, so we have to protect it. We need to maintain stable cardiac, pulmonary, and renal function. That will be the goal of treatment, to keep these organs as, and their values as close to normal, quote unquote, as we can, or whatever their baseline happens to be. And then care is going to be focused on monitoring these values and monitoring the client and then preventing and managing any complications that will be coming along with this disease. So, lupus. Systemic lupus erythematosus, otherwise known as SLE, 
will affect fewer than 25 people per 100,000 in North America, South America, Europe, and Asia. So it is not very common. The female to male ratio in children affected by SLE is three to one, but, but is as high as 15 to one for women during childbearing years. So this is the population where we are going to focus our treatment plan on these women in childbearing years. Age of onset will vary according to gender and ethnicity. So 65% of patients are diagnosed between the ages of 16 to 55. So again, we are looking at that age group, 16 young adults, to 55, not such a young adult, but we are encompassing those childbearing years. We are looking at these years where um, our population or this population is forming relationships. At 16, they may be sexually active, so we need to talk to them about birth control. And then in their 20s and 30s, as they are forming their, um, their lifelong relationships with their significant other, and then childbearing years. So people who have relatives with SLE are at a higher risk than the general population for developing the disease. So again, this is a topic. This tells me that it is it will travel in families. Genes have been identified that will predispose patients to SLE. So again, we know this is genetic. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up, listen up, and then listen up one more time. The butterfly rash, the butterfly rash over the nose, the bridge of the nose and the cheeks is a classic sign. It is a classic sign. You will be able to recognize this rash as soon as you see it. And this uh, lupus, SLE, is exacerbated by pregnancy due to the rise of estrogen. So again, these women of childbearing years, um, we need to take specific care with this population. Clinical manifestations, ladies and gentlemen, listen up, listen up, and then listen up one more time. General-wise, constitutional-wise, they will complain of fever and fatigue. Fever and fatigue. They may complain of some difficulty concentrating, there may be the rash, that butterfly rash. They may have photosensitivity. Musculoskeletal wise, they may have joint pain with or without synovitis. And remember, synovitis is that inflammation of the synovial fluid around the joint where they have done something to piss off the joint and that synovial fluid is now inflamed. They may complain of muscle pain or muscle weakness. They may have lupus nephritis, that is where the kidneys will be involved, and they may have extra protein in their urine. Neurologically, they are at risk for stroke and seizures. Cardiovascular-wise, they are at risk for pericarditis and endocarditis. This is an inflammation of the heart. Pulmonary-wise, they may have pleurisy, or a pleural effusion. Ocular-wise, eyes, they may have retinal lesions. They may have dry eyes. They may develop leukopenia, thrombocytopenia. And ladies and gentlemen, these is, I only gave you a brief synopsis of these clinical manifestations in your textbook. I'm not exactly sure of the, of the chart, um, where the chart is, but there is a chart in your textbook. Um, that will give you a, a terrific uh, rundown of the clinical manifestations of SLE. So diagnosis. Diagnosis is a complicated process in most patients unless they present with compelling evidence of clinical manifestations and then labs to support these clinical manifestations. And that only makes sense, right? 
So we're going to look at them clinically. We're going to we're going to do our assessment. Doctor will do his assessment. He will do his evaluation, and then we're going to look at some labs. And this is how we will come to this diagnosis. There is 11 criteria, and four of the 11 criteria must be present to support this diagnosis. There is a table on page 356. That is 356 in my textbook. I apologize. I don't know what it is in the second edition, and it is table 19.9. In my book, I do apologize. I don't know what it is in your book, if you have the second edition. There is no specific test for diagnosis. Lab findings are used to support or confirm the diagnosis when combined with, again, the patient history, because it all starts with the patient's history and the patient's physical exam, the assessment. It will always begin there. Lab testing will be used to confirm the presence of autoantibodies. Specifically, SLE patients will produce ANAs, which will confirm the presence of an autoimmune disease. The presence of ANAs do not confirm the diagnosis of SLE, as 2% of healthy individuals also will be positive. So again, we need to do further testing, further diagnostics. The way they are presenting clinically, we will look at the patient history and then doctor's physical exam. Other lab values that are important in diagnosing and treating SLE will be a complete blood count, the CBC. We can see leukopenia, which is decreased white cells. We can see thrombocytopenia, which are decreased platelets. We may see anemia, which is a decreased red blood cell count. And also, ladies and gentlemen, I want you can, to consider this. When we are looking at, the, at this CBC and we are reading doctor's notes, and you may oftentimes see this with a rheumatologist or an infectious disease where they may make a reference to, in the lab studies when they're talking about the WBC count, there is a shift to the left. When doctor is discussing a shift to the left, that is the presence of infection. Your analysis with random and protein creatinine levels, so we're going to do a UA. We are going to look at the serum creatinine level and the BUN level. What is their kidney function? Is it within the norm? And again, we are looking at the CRP, the C-reactive protein, and the ESR rates to identify any inflammation because we know that when these levels are elevated, inflammation is present. Imaging is not used to diagnose SLE. And however, there is a table on page 357, and again, that is in my book. I have the first edition. It is table 1910, and um, that can give you a rundown of the common imaging results. So non-pharmacological therapy, ladies and gentlemen, listen up, listen up, and then listen up one more time. This population needs to avoid sun exposure, and they need to use a sunscreen SPF of 50 or higher, and they need to use it every day, every day. Because if your client is one of those clients that does have the butterfly rash, when they go out into the sun, they are going to be photosensitive, and I have seen the, um, the butterfly rash can actually blister. So they need to use a sunscreen SPF of 50 or higher every day. They need to use it daily. They need to follow a well-balanced diet. There need to be frequent rest periods, again, with a regular sleep schedule to assist with their fatigue. Because again, general-wise, constitutionally-wise, what they are going to complain of is fever and fatigue. So rest periods are very important. Regular exercise to improve strength and maintain range of motion, and then a healthy weight. Again, we want to keep these joints um, fluid. We want to keep them movable. We want to keep them free of stiffness. So pharmacological therapy is going to be based on disease manifestations. 
anti-malarial medications such as Plaquenil, which will impair antigen antibody reactions. However, with Plaquenil, the concern for renal toxicity and irreversible blindness is a huge concern. Ladies and gentlemen, please take note. Listen up, listen up, listen up. When we are talking about Plaquenil, there is a huge concern for retinal toxicity and irreversible blindness. We can use non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications such as ibuprofen to treat arthralgias, myalgias, headache, and fever because, again, they are going to complain of fatigue and fever. Glucocorticosteroids will suppress inflammation in the joints, in the kidneys, and in the other organ systems. Immunosuppressive agents such as methotrexate, again, to treat joint inflammation that is not responding to non-steroids, anti-inflammatories, or steroids, right? So again, even though we are talking about um, lupus, um, still these DMARDs, this methotrexate can come into play. And then the, bi the biologics, the Benlista, which has been approved since 2011. It was the first new treatment approved in more than 40 years, and it will interfere with inflammation, decreasing the immune response that will cause these clinical manifestations. So again, we are going to use DMARDs and biologics. Some complications are renal failure, premature heart disease, because again, we are talking about a very young population starting at age 16 interstitial lung disease, hypercoagulation, they are at risk for stroke, and then avascular necrosis of their joints. Ladies and gentlemen, listen up, listen up, listen up. There is an increased risk for infection with this population, so they need to avoid those potential situations where they will come into contact with a lot of people. Again, these days, nobody wants to come into contact with a lot of people, but we have to keep this population especially isolated. So this is not somebody that can go to a ball game. This is not somebody that we can advise to go to the movies or to a shopping mall or to a crowded beach. Okay, we need, they need to understand that they can, of course, go to these places, but they need to sit apart. There needs to be that, what we call now, that social distancing because we need to keep them safe. There is an increased risk for infection with this population. And there are toxicities that are related to a pharmacological therapy, always toxicities related, right, because of the medications. So nursing management, what are we going to do for this population? We are going to assess, and then we are going to assess again. We are going to administer medications, and ladies and gentlemen, please listen up, listen up, and then listen up one more time for me. We are going to instruct these patients, these female patients, on the use of contraceptives to avoid pregnancy because these cytotoxic medications that they are going to be placed on, these DMARDs and these biologics, they are cytotoxic, as we have already discussed, and they can cause birth defects. So while they are taking these medications, extra precautions have to be taken that they do not conceive. Because remember, we are dealing with that population, the population of women in childbearing age. Patient education will, of course, include the disease process, clients need to know what's coming in the next phase of their disease. And again, they need to know that they need to use sunscreen daily, every day before they go out, an SPF 50 or higher. They need to be up to date with their immunizations. However, this population cannot take a live vaccine. They cannot receive a live vaccine. And again, we are going to talk to them about energy conservation because they are going to complain of fatigue. Remember those fever and fatigue complaints. They need to know 
to avoid oral contraceptives if they are prone to migraines because migraine can be a precursor to stroke and this population is an, at an increased risk for stroke so they need to know they cannot take an oral contraceptive however they need to be educated on contraceptives while they are taking these cytotoxic medications we will assist with referrals to the pulmonologist to the nephrologist the neurologist and the cardiologist right because we need to have all of these physicians this whole team on board to deal with this disease process and it is so very important that these patients be allowed to verbalize their feelings and that we are there to offer emotional support.